Great resource for a Sunday school class. Great resource for a Sunday night service. Great resource for a Wednesday night service. Great resource for a small group. When Ordinary People Stand in the Gap, DVD available in our Cultural Institute at afastore.net. All right, well, let's jump into the Word of God as we typically do at the beginning of the program. USS Focal Point, so warship, it's not a pleasure cruise. We're engaging in cultural warfare starting right now, which is spiritual warfare. Our number one weapon is the truth. Satan's only weapon is the lie, so we defeat him, we confront him, we defeat him, we disarm him by exposing his lies and telling the truth. So that's what we do. We train the big guns on board the USS Focal Point at the lies the strongholds of error, deception, deceit, and darkness that Satan has got so many people in our culture to believe. It traps people in bondage. It traps cultures in bondage. And we want to set people free. Paul says these strongholds in 2 Corinthians 10 keep people from the knowledge of God. So we want everybody to know God. So we want to tear down these strongholds so everybody in America can come into a relationship with God. That's why we deal with all of these issues, the whole range of issues in our culture, because Satan has told lies in every one of those areas that keep people from the knowledge of the truth. Now, we are in Psalm 40 today, uh, which are where our reading has taken us. Here's what David says in verse 16 and 17. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, David says, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. So David says in verse 16, he's looking around him, and he's seeing people that are rejoicing in God, and they're glad. And they are continually saying, great is the Lord. They're riding high. David looks around. Everybody seems to be doing great. Everybody seems to be happy. Everybody seems to be up. Everybody seems to be cruising through life. Everybody seems to be enjoying life. But then David says in verse 17, but as for me, in contrast to all these people that look around and they look to me, like they're happy. The reality is they're not. They're just like you and me on the inside, but they look like they're happy. And David says, as for me, I am poor and needy. Now the word for poor here means poor, afflicted, or humble. The word that's translated needy, I am poor and needy, means to be in want. It means to be needy. It means to be poor. So it means to be poor as opposed to rich. Poor as opposed to being flush. Poor as opposed to being uh, financially strapped as opposed to being rolling in the dough. And there are times when it seems like we're in this all by ourselves. Everybody's doing well financially. They're fulfilling their financial ambitions and their dreams. And we're kind of stuck here in neutral with no money in the bank account, no money in the wallet. Now, uh, David points out here that even though it might look like that, even though it may feel like that, it is not true. I want to talk about this just for a moment. He says in verse 17, yeah, I am poor and needy, but, in verse 17, but, but is a contrast word. It's an adversity. We're changing direction here. We're going this way. Now we're turning 180, going the other way. The Lord takes thought for me. Yahweh takes thought For me, the word to take thought literally means to think, to account, or to account for. So I might be in a situation where it may seem to me like nobody knows who I am. Nobody really cares about me. Nobody's thinking about me. I think if I'm gone, nobody is going to miss me. Nobody's going to come looking for me. But David says that is absolutely not true. David says God will never lose track of me. He always takes account of me. He always knows where I am at all times. He knows exactly how I'm doing. He knows exactly what I need. Remember the movie uh, Home Alone, where the whole family took off for Christmas vacation? And what did they do? 
They left Kevin behind. They did not take Kevin into account. They forgot all about him. His mom didn't realize they'd left Kevin at home until they're on the plane in midair. So they forgot to account for Kevin while they were loading up to go to the airport. They didn't account for him when they were checking in. They didn't account for him while they were boarding the plane. Now, here's the point I'm getting to. What God says to us here in Psalm 41, I am never going to let you be Kevin. I'm never going to leave you in a situation where nobody's looking out for you. Nobody's taking account of you. Nobody knows how you're doing. God says, I'm accounting for you. And I'm talking to people in our listening audience right now. Maybe you feel like this. Maybe you feel like nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares about you. Nobody gives you a second thought. Nobody's thinking about you during the day. You may think that. And this is the word for you. God says, I'm never going to do that to you. People might. But I'm never going to do that. God says to you, as he says to me, I am accounting for you all the time. So God says to you and says to me, there is never a time when I'm not thinking about you. There's never a time when you are not in my thoughts. There is never a time when I'm not aware of what you are going through, what's going through your mind, what's going on in your heart. I am always, God says, thinking about you. Now, here's the application part. If you're in that place where you think that nobody cares about you, nobody cares whether you live or die, that's just plain wrong. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And remember, the lie is the only weapon that Satan has, if he can get you to believe this, that there's nobody in the universe that cares about me, nobody's thinking about me, that's what leads people to suicide. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. So it's time to renounce that lie. If you're thinking that lie right now, it's time to renounce that lie in the name of Jesus Christ and declare to him the truth of the word of God, just exactly like Jesus did, and do this out loud. Don't just do this in your mind. Don't just do it in your heart. Good to do it there too. But do this out loud. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, what did he do? He quoted to Satan the word of God. That's how he resisted him. That's how he shattered the power of the lies that Satan was trying to get him to believe. So just declare to Satan, Psalm 41, verse 17. As for me, I am poor and needy, but Satan... The Lord takes thought for me. I rebuke this lie. I rebuke your deception that nobody's looking out for me. I rebuke that. I declare that to be false in the name of Jesus Christ. I resist you, Satan, and I command that you take this thought and leave my presence. And then finish up by saying to God, You, O Lord, are my help and my deliverer. Please, O God, do not delay. Well, let's take these thoughts and go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, I pray for myself today. I pray for my family. I pray for the listening audience of Focal Point. I pray for, right now for every man, woman, and child within the sound of my voice, everyone who's listening to my voice right now. And I pray for them as well as for myself. I pray for our elected officials who can experience these things, for our city council members, for our mayors, for our legislators at the state level, for our governor. We pray for our congressman, pray for our president, President Trump. And I pray for us for those times when troubles without number surround us and our sins overtake us so that our heart fails within us. And Lord, I know there are many people right now whose heart is failing within them they feel like they are surrounded by troubles without number. I pray, Lord, for them right now that you will not withhold your mercy from them, but instead that you will cause your love and your truth to protect them always. I pray that you will be pleased to come and save them, save us while you're at it, and come quickly to help them when they need you. I pray that those who desire their ruin, those who desire our ruin, would be put to shame and confusion and be turned back in disgrace. May they in time come to be appalled 
at their own shame for the way in which they have treated us. I pray that we will seek you and we will rejoice and be glad in you. I pray that we will love your salvation and always exalt us. Please think of us when we are poor and needy and do not delay to be our help and our deliverer. I pray these things for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 41, good passage of Scripture. All right, a couple of quick things as we're heading toward the first break. Uh, got a film out coming out. I want you to make you aware of it. It's going to be coming out on Netflix. I don't think it has a, has a release date yet, but it's Habit. The name of the film is Habit, and it's a film about Jesus who's being played as a lesbian by a woman. So realize how blasphemous this movie is. In the movie, God is a woman. God is not only a woman, but he is a promiscuous woman. God is also a female who is attracted to multiple other women. God is a lesbian. Jesus Christ is a lesbian, and he is not only that, he is a drug dealer. You want to do something about it, you can go to onemillionmoms.com. There's a petition there where you can sign to make your opinion known about this blasphemous movie. All right. I um, want to say one more thing about this Louisiana Supreme Court decision yesterday. I want to be clear. I was a little bit muddled in what I said yesterday. Back in 2016, John Roberts was for rules for abortion clinics. Now, yesterday, he's against them. Switched on a dime for no reason. Be right back. Stay with us.
This is Richard Land. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on Conservative Talk Radio. And ladies and gentlemen, I am telling you, and I'm talking to you guys out there. I'm talking about you dads. I'm talking about you males. What we need in this country right now are masculine Christians. Men who are not afraid of their masculinity, that are willing to act courageously, to act like men, as Paul instructs us to do in 1 Corinthians 16, because that's what we need right now in our country. By the way, quick story out of Oklahoma, the state of my birth. A fisherman there, Rob, you, you, you like to fish, don't you? Oh, yeah. Okay. You know what? A, you, do you know what a paddle fish is? I've I, seen them. Yeah. Have you I've seen, seen them, Jeff? Him. Yeah. Okay. It's a big, th- this guy was, there's a big, humongous fish that this guy was, was holding. Anyway, this guy in, in Oklahoma smashed a state record and a world record for catching a paddle fish. He's from Edmonds, Oklahoma, was fishing at Keystone Lake. <laughs> this is amazing. The fish that he caught, it weighed 146 pounds Good. Wow. and 11 ounces. It's wow. 70.5 inches long. 45 inches around. So set a new world record for the paddlefish. You know, and shoot, I thought maybe that'd be a world record that would be within my reach, but I guess not. No. According according to the senator out of Louisiana, that, that might have been John Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody might be inclined to throw him in there, you know, and somebody go, else go in there and, and fish him out. Like it reminds me of... Um, of what uh, I think is Benjamin Disraeli said, or some wag back in the 19th century said about Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister in Britain and stuff like that. And uh, somebody asked him to define the difference between a misfortune and a tragedy. And he said, well, if Benjamin Disraeli were to fall into the River Thames, that would be a misfortune. If somebody were to fish him out, that would be a tragedy. (laughs) Okay. All right, well, let's uh, turn our attention to other items of the day. Um, a lot of places to start. Let me start with this column, just some excerpts from a column by Victor Davis Hanson. And the title of his column, and I think he's exactly right about this, Only Trump Win in November Can Stop the Cultural Revolution. Realize we are in the midst of an honest-to-goodness revolution. I mean, this is a revolution that is being fought by people with guns. And they're using these guns. And they're beating people into uh, submission. And Victor Davis hands and says, The only thing between us and the complete meltdown, the complete destruction of the American experiment, is the re-election of Donald Trump. And I believe that he is right. Now, I know there may be a lot of opinions about Donald Trump in this listening audience. I'm sure of that. And there's a lot of things about Donald Trump that I don't care for. A lot of things he says. A lot of things he does. A lot of things he tweets. You don't like some of those things? you got company here. I'm with you on that. But there is nobody else. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. There is nobody else. There is nobody else in America right now that is fighting for our values, our heritage, our history, and our traditions. Nobody. You take the collective batch of Republicans up on Capitol Hill, they're worthless. They're a waste of space. They're a waste of oxygen. They're doing nothing to defend the things that made this country great. Donald Trump's the one guy standing out there alone to do it. If he goes down in November, we have got nobody. We've got no advocate. We have no champion. We have got bupkis. So Victor Davis Hanson says that's where we're at. But if Donald Trump can get reelected, then he thinks things can turn around. He said this, I don't think the election is anymore just about Donald Trump or Joe Biden 
or Democrat or Republican, or Trump agenda versus the Biden agenda. It's more or less, listen to this, what this election is about, Victor Davis Hanson says, is about whether you liked the United States more as it was before Memorial Day, or whether you would prefer that America turn into what's evolving after Memorial Day. So do you like America as it was founded, or would you prefer the America that these anti the Zantifa folks and these Black Lives Matter want to turn it in to? Which do you prefer? Because that's the choice in November. It's a choice between two Americas. America as founded or the wreck that people on the left want to turn it into. You know, and, and he made an interesting observation that he did not believe we would have the degree of violence we're seeing today if it hadn't been for this national lockdown. You know, I've been against this lockdown absolutely from day one. You know this. You listen to me. Dead set against it. Colossal mistake. Completely unnecessary, foolish, foolhardy, even stupid, self-inflicted wound. So I've never been for this lockdown. And Victor Davis Hanson adds another reason to be against this thing. He says, I think that every day the violence was aggravated, not just by the fear of the virus, but by essentially almost 90 days of self-imposed quarantine, by economic recession, 40 million people out of work, and suddenly to let all of that go in one burst. And he points out that this is really an issue of choosing between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Which revolution do you prefer? If you don't know what the French Revolution is all about, read up on it. Because the French Revolution was about anarchy. It was about out-of-control mob violence. It was anti-God. They were destroying cathedrals. They were putting clergy on the guillotine. It was mob rule. And that's what the people on the left, that's what they're pushing for. They want to tear down statues of Jesus. They want to break stained glass windows that have his image on them. That's where they're going. American Revolution was all about God. It was all about liberty. The French Revolution was about tyranny. It was about totalitarianism. The American Revolution was about liberty. It was about freedom. It was about biblical values. And I mentioned this before, 52 of the 55 founders who crafted the Constitution, they were men who took an oath. When they joined the church they went to, on oath, they swore before Almighty God that they believed a doctrinal statement that would be identical to any good evangelical doctrinal statement that you could find today. So that's our choice. The America as we were founded or the America that they want to turn it into. And the only one that's representing America as it was founded right now is Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, with all of his flaws. flaws. And remember, Victor David Hansen was the one that said, America doesn't have to be perfect to be good. Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, does not have to be perfect in order to be good, in order to be good for uh, America. And the interviewer was talking to him, asked him, uh, are we? Uh, does Trump winning stop the cultural revolution? Victor Davis Hanson, enormously smart dude, said, yeah, I think it will. Because I think what they're saying to us is that everybody is to be judged by the worst thing they did in their life. Not their best thing. Or that we in the 21st century are going to add up your life up in the past we're going to put on one side your pluses, on the other side all of your minuses, all the ones we can dredge up, all the ones that we can invent, all the ones that we can manufacture, and then we're going to judge you according to whether you have more pluses or more minuses. So Donald Trump is the only way out of that uh, abyss. So that's a word looking uh, forward. All right. Let us... Oh, I had a... Uh, had a um, Supreme Court ruling today, and I'm gonna, I may surprise you a little bit on this. It was a Supreme Court ruling that struck down a part of the Montana State Constitution that said no taxpayer dollars can go to fund religious schools. And the Supreme Court said that is contrary to the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. It's contrary to the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. So we are striking down that Montana law, 
were striking down that part of the Montana state constitution. So now taxpayer dollars can, in fact, go to support religious schools. Now, in terms of the outcome, I love it. I celebrate it. It's a win for families. It's a win for religious liberty. It's a win for black families, by the way, because they get stuck in these crime-ridden neighborhoods. They get stuck in these government-run schools that aren't teaching their kids anything. We've got a lot of students in these larger cities, and their performance on the national uh, assessment of educational uh, dismal. They can't read past the fourth grade. They're reading at a third, fourth grade level as sixth graders, as eighth graders. So they need alternatives. And so the Supreme Court said today it's okay to give parents alternatives. And, and the plaintiffs in this case were uh, three low-income moms who just wanted a good education for their kids. They wanted to get it at this private school that was run by a Baptist church. Today they got their wish. So... I do not want to be misunderstood about this. This is a good outcome for those families. It's a good outcome for those children that will be going to these schools. However, and this is where I'm going to surprise you a little bit, but hear me out on this, and don't forget what I just said. I love the result of this case for families and for students who are just looking for the best educational option. I have felt from day one that what we ought to do with education is education dollars should follow the student to the school of the parent's choice. That's what we ought to do. We got these education dollars. Let's let the parents choose the school they want for their kid, and then we'll let the taxpayer dollars follow their child to the school of their choice. That's how we ought to be doing that. And this Supreme Court decision is going to make that possible. But... This is actually a bad day for the Constitution and for the rule of law. And I'll tell you why. Because this is not a decision that the Supreme Court of the United States should even be considering. This is not a case that they even should have taken up. Remember the way the founders set things up is that all of these decisions... Decisions that affected the life within a state, within the borders of that state, all of those decisions would be left up to the states. The federal government wouldn't have any part of it. And what the Supreme Court to, did today is they took away a little piece of the right of states to govern themselves. Now, it's fine. So let's say we like this ruling today. What happens if the, if the same Supreme Court uh, we're to get somebody different on it. And the next time they make a rule, they say, no, we've changed our mind. And no longer can religious schools get a dime of taxpayer dollars. Might even be Montana. So you got these judges in Washington, D.C. deciding what happens in the state of Montana. Absolutely, flatly, totally contrary to the government, the form of government that the founders established for us. John Roberts, by the way, wrote the majority opinion. This is five to four. Another close one. But I want to read some quotes from the Founding Fathers to explain my position. As I do not want to be misunderstood. I want to be clear here that my objection to this, I'm happy about the ruling. I'm happy for the families. I'm happy for every family in America that's going to be positively affected by that will increase educational options. However, this is a bad day for the Constitution because as once again the federal government and the Supreme Court Extending the reach of the federal government where it does not belong deep inside the internal functions of the individual states. A really, really, really bad idea. And it just got worse uh, today. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. That the federal government is interdicted from intermeddling in matters of religion. The Constitution, Jefferson understood correctly forbids the federal government to meddle with matters of religion at the state level. They can't do it. They are forbidden to interfere in any way. Religion, Andy McCarthy says, quoting Thomas Jefferson, was an issue left to the states and their citizens 
and we trusted them to handle it responsibly. So in other words, Jefferson saying, look, matters of religion, this is a matter of religion, because we're talking about religious schools, we're talking about educational institutions run by religious entities, that, Thomas Jefferson said, is an issue that is left to the states and their decisions. In other words, my point of view on this, ladies and gentlemen, if we are following the Constitution, again, we can't make up our mind about whether we like a ruling based exclusively on whether we like it or not, because that's what the Supreme Court is doing, and that leads them to perfectly terrible, terrible decisions. If we follow the Constitution as it is written, as the founders structured it for us, then Montana, when it comes to religion, Montana can do anything that they want. That also means that every other state can do whatever they want. So there were a lot of states that were sending money to private schools, religious schools, and the Supreme Court shut all that down. Last time they ruled on this, they shut that completely down. Here is the way that Just Justice Potter Stewart put it in 1961 in the Abington case. Listen to this. As a matter of, this is a Democrat now, guy on the left side of the ledger on the Supreme Court. As a matter of history, the First Amendment was adopted solely as a limitation upon the newly created national government. How many times have you heard me say that? Here's a Supreme Court justice, a Democrat, saying the same things. The Establishment Clause was primarily an attempt to ensure that Congress not only would be powerless to establish a national church, but would also be unable to interfere with existing state establishments. Stewart said the amendment was designed to leave the states free to go their own way on matters of religion. Be right back.
American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Rob, I got a quick question. Looking at the rundown, did we yeah. get? Did we have time to get the Dr. Scott Atlas clip? Yeah, at the very top. Hold okay, on. good. All right. I printed this out after that was entered into the rundown. Uh, anyway, uh, let's play a few sound bites here. Here's Dr. Scott Atlas. He's uh, at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, was, uh, I think, former neurosurgeon specialist at the Stanford School of Medicine, so a really smart dude. And he's been one of the brightest guys, brightest crayons in the box on this COVID shutdown, this COVID lockdown. And here's what he says, you know, and Dr. Fauci, bless his heart, he's out there yesterday. We can't open schools. It's going to be a death knell. It's going to be the end of civilization as we know it. If students are allowed to go back to school in person in the fall, it's going to be the end of civilization as we have known it. Here's what Dr. Scott Atlas says, clip J1. There's no reason for a lockdown when we have something happening that we actually have no problem with. These do not translate into people going into respirators. The hospitalization stays, by the way, are half the length that they were before. We're not, we're doing very well with this. But the point about the schools is really critical because this is the most irrational public policy probably in, in modern history. There is no science behind having children not attend schools. There is zero science for having children wear masks or have spacing when they have zero risk from the disease. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. I mean, this guy knows a whole lot more about this stuff than you and I do. And he's not compromised. You know, I, I, I'll tell you what I think. I don't know if you saw the story yesterday. Remdesivir is now the drug of choice for the, for the deep staters in the medical establishment. And uh, Remdesivir says, we're going to cut every, we're going to cut everybody a break. We're only going to charge them $3,100 for a treatment of Remdesivir. We're giving you guys the break of the decade. You can go to Fred Meyer. You can get a box, you can get a jar, bottle of hydroxychloroquine proven to work if you started early enough for fourteen ninety five, And now Remdesivir thinks they're cutting us a break by only charging $3,100 for something that isn't yet even proven to work. Why did that happen? Because Dr. Fauci has consistently demonized hydroxychloroquine. Why? I suspect... It's because he wanted to do something nice for his buddies in Big Pharma. They're loving it. Big Pharma's loving it. Our buddy, Tony Fauci's, making it possible for us to make a killing off of the illness and disease of the American people, and we love him for it. Now, again, hydroxychloroquine, it works if you start using it at the first sign of symptoms. You wait till somebody's on a ventilator, it's too late, but it's too late for anything at that point. So anyway, no science, Dr. Scott Atlas, no science behind uh, having children not attend schools. Now, uh, John Kennedy, the senator from Louisiana, uh, he's colorful. The media loves him because he's a colorful guy. So he was interviewed yesterday about the Roberts decision, the way he flipped. He did a 180 on this. In 2016, he was, uh, he was for regulations for admitting privilege requirements for abortion clinics. He was all for it. He was distressed that the Supreme Court struck down admitting privileges regulations in Texas. Then this week, he's all against them. Now he wants them all shredded. He wants them torn down. So there's a complete 180 offered no justification for it other than that we have to honor precedent. We've got to honor a prior decision, which he said in 2016 was fatally flawed. So now yesterday, John Roberts says, I am compelled to uphold a ruling that I have determined already is fatally flawed and ought to be dumped in the ash can. Now he's supporting it. He's defending it. So, I mean, I don't even understand one part of that equation. I do not know what's going on in his head, but, but this is a dizzying uh, shift in position. And Senator Kennedy from Louisiana calls him out on a clip one. The process bothers me as much as the result. 
Uh, the Chief Justice today joined with the four liberals on the court to strike down Louisiana's statute. Four years ago, in a case out of Texas, same statute, same issue, Ch the Chief Justice voted with the conservatives. Today, he voted with the liberals. He changed his vote. Uh, he flip-flopped. He flip-flopped like a bank catfish. <laughs> and uh, that's why I say the process worries me as much as the result. This is why so many people think the, that our, our federal courts, our federal judges have become nothing but politicians in robes. Now, the Chief Justice famously says all the time that he's just an umpire. All he does is call balls and strikes. That's right. Well, four years ago, he called a ball. Today, same pitch. He called a strike. And uh, I don't know what else to say, Martha. Yeah. He just changed his vote with no explanation. Well, what you say is, Chief Justice John Roberts, you got to adjust your strike zone. The strike zone is set by the Constitution. You've got to make your call. That's the strike zone. You can't keep changing that thing around on people. Uh, we didn't want you in the Supreme Court because we thought you'd do this to us. We thought you would be what you said you were going to be, an umpire just calling balls and strikes. Now, um, one other thing going back to the Montana religious liberty decision uh, Montana had what was called a Blaine Amendment, B-L-A-I-N-E. This is from a senator from Maine by the name of James Blaine. He tried to amend the federal constitution to say that no dollars, no taxpayer dollars could be spent on religious schools. He failed. Uh, so he decided he just do it state by state. So a lot of states have these Blaine Amendments. Idaho, where I came from, is one of them. And a Blaine Amendment says you can't spend any taxpayer dollars on religious schools. You know why that's in there? Because James Blaine was an anti-Catholic bigot. All the public schools at that time, all the government schools, were Protestant-run schools. The principals were Protestants. The school boards were Protestants. The teachers were Protestants. The families that sent their kids there were Protestants. And so the Roman Catholic denomination or tradition, they started their, started their own schools so their kids could be exposed to Roman Catholic instruction. And the Blaine Amendment, uh, they were enacted and said, no, you can't do that. We are going to discriminate against Catholic forms of education. We are going to discriminate in favor of Protestant schools, but against Roman Catholic schools. That's the issue here. The Supreme Court, I believe, completely exceeded its jurisdiction by striking that uh, down. All right. I got some others. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's go to clip number two. This is uh, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. You know, and we've got Democrats all over the fruited plain saying we have got to com we got to do away with uh, police forces. We got to get rid of them. We got to abolish the police. You know, and, and some people are finding out how that works. You know, even in uh, Seattle, which is supposed to be the, uh, I don't know, the beating heart of liberalism up here on the West Coast or the left coast, uh, the mayor of Seattle, the protesters, remember, she tried to send the cops in there. I mean, she's been all about this autonomous zone. She's supported it. This is wonderful. This is Americans defending their point of view, expressing themselves, engaging in freedom of speech. This is marvelous. And then they started destroying that part of her town, destroyed the third precinct where the police hung out. Now they're hanging out there. It's like that last scene in Animal Farm. I don't know if you ever read that one book. You ought to read it sometime. Not a long book, but it's about socialism, George Orwell's assessment of socialism. And in the book, the pigs are oppressed. When the story starts, they're on the farm. They're oppressed by the farmer. So they decide they're going to lead a revolt. They are going to unseat the farmer. And they are going to establish a form of government that's equal for everybody. And so they do it. They get rid of the farmer. They kill the farmer. And what happens then is the pigs move into the farmhouse. They start sitting in the living room where the farmer used to sit. They start eating at the table that the farmer used to eat at, and now the rest of the animals on the farm are still out there eating slop in the mud. 
That's what happens under socialism. And uh, so anyway, so Mayor Durkin of Seattle, she was uh, all for them until they started trashing her city. Now she wants them out of there. She sent the police there to take those barricades out. And the people in the autonomous zone just said, no, we're not going to let you do it. They just stood there. Just stood there in front of the police. And the mayor didn't urge them to arrest these people for resisting arrest, for defying the legally authorized order of the mayor. She just let them do it. So the police just retreated. They just retreated. They just backed down. So what does the left learn from this? They learn from this that the police in cities that are run by Democrats have been emasculated. They have, uh, they have been neutered by their mayors. We have nothing to fear from the police in any city that's run by Democrats. And this is what Tim Scott is talking about in clip two. Clip two. You know, here's the truth. In Detroit, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, all these cities could have banned chokeholds themselves. They could have increased the police reporting themselves. They could have more data information themselves. They could have de-escalation training themselves. They could have duty to intervene themselves, Minneapolis as well. All these communities have been run by Democrats for decades, decades. What is the ROI for the poorest people in this nation? And I don't blame them. I blame an elite political class with billions of dollars to do whatever they want to do and look at the results for the poorest, most vulnerable people in our nation. I'm willing to compete for their vote. Are you? And he's calling out his Republican colleagues on this. I'm going to go into those big cities that have been run by Democrats. They've turned these things into big, giant trash heaps. And who suffers? It's the poor. It's minority families that just want to give their kids a shot at a decent education and a shot at a better life, and they're prevented from doing it by Democrats. You know, remember, uh, the Washington Post did an expose, or set out to do an expose, on Donald Trump's assessment that the 20 worst violence-prone cities in America have been run by Democrats for decades. So they researched it, and they found that President Trump was wrong. Because Jacksonville, just a few months ago, elected a Republican mayor. Now, he's probably got elected because the Democrats had run Jacksonville so far into the ground that the people said, we have got to take a chance even on a Republican to pull us out of this mess. So now the Washington Post is all proud of themselves. We were right. It's not all the cities in New York and in, in America. It's all but one, 19 out of 20. Um, now, let's go to clip number three. By the way, I uh, am not going to probably have time to get to this anytime in the near future. So let me uh, get to this right now. It's an article from the Smithsonian. Again, this is a left-wing institution, the Smithsonian, writing about the Trail of Tears. The protesters are going after Andrew Jackson because he was president when the Trail of Tears happened. By the way, the policy that led to the Indian removal, that was, a, that was supported by nine successive presidential administrations. You can't just hang that all around Andrew Jackson's neck. But they want to tear his statue down because he was the Trail of Tears guy. Well, what the Smithsonian says, here's what you need to know about the Trail of Tears, and about the Cherokees that were the Indian tribes that were being removed to Oklahoma. I have some ancestry linked to them. I've got some Cherokee blood in me from this Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. What the Smithsonian says, what you probably don't picture are Cherokee slaveholders. Cherokees who are slaveholders. Foremost among them, Cherokee Chief John Ross. He's the George Washington of the Cherokee Nation. He was a slaveholder. The Smithsonian goes on, what you probably don't picture are the numerous African-American slaves Cherokee owned 
who made the brutal march themselves or else were shipped in mass to what is now Oklahoma aboard cramped boats by their wealthy their wealthy Indian mascot. Smith said this is what the story should be. The story should be needs to be that the enslaved black people and the soon to be exiled red people would join forces and defeat their oppressor. The five civilized tribes, all part of the Indian removal, this is the Smithsonian, the five civilized tribes were deeply committed to slavery. They established their own racialized black codes. They immediately reestablished slavery when they arrived in Indian territory. They rebuilt their nations with slave labor. They crushed slave rebellions and incited with the Confederacy in the Civil War enthusiastically. That's it for today. God bless you. We'll see you back here tomorrow.